Hello, this presentation is about how to compute the normals for the surface of rotation. It's intended for project number four in spring of 2022. And part of this project is to form a surface of rotation. So in particular, we have a function, which I'll call h, as a function of the radius, h of r, which in this assignment is 1 plus 0 0.08 r squared times sine of r over r. For the purposes of this presentation, we're not going to do anything special about h. It's just that it's a surface of rotation. In this particular example, though, it looks something like this. Here's the r axis, the y axis. h of r is this graph here. And we're rotating it around the y-axis. So in three space, this looks something like the following. Here's the x-axis to the right, y-axis upward, z-axis is pointing out of the board towards the viewer. And we're rotating this surface h, so here's the graph of h, something like this, around the y-axis, letting r be the distance from the y-axis. So the surface looks something like this. Okay. Now, in particular, let's get some variables going here. R is the distance from the y-axis. It's the square root of x squared plus z squared. Uh, we're thinking of y here is the h of r value, and we'll sometimes write h of r theta and h of x z to denote the same rotated function h here. So um, with a top view, here's the x-axis and the z-axis and the y-axis is pointing out towards the viewer. If we have angle theta measured from the z-axis out to some point x, y, z, there's the distance r from the y-axis. So r here is the square root of x squared plus z squared. And also z equals r times cosine of theta and x equals r times sine of theta. These conventions on z, x, and r are because we're measuring the angle theta from the z-axis, measuring in the counterclockwise direction from this particular top view. So we're going to talk about three different methods to compute the normal vectors. So for the project, the, the, we'd like to compute normal vectors, which are vectors sticking out of the surface at right angles, perpendicular to the surface. And we'll do three different pro methods. The first one will be fairly conceptual based on directly on the fact that H is a surface of rotation, surface of revolution. Uh, the second will use the method of cross products of partial derivatives. The third will use the gradient method. So method number one is sort of an ad hoc method for surfaces of revolution. We start by graphing the function h just as a function of r. And so, looks here's some function h. And here's some point on the graph of h. And we want to draw a first a vector tangent to the surface and then a vector perpendicular. So the tangent vector will be something like this, and this can be 1 comma h prime of r. h prime is the first derivative of r. So this vector clearly has slope h prime, so its slope matches the surface. Now the perpendicular or normal vector is at right angles to this, 
up here. And we can take any vector of any length. We, we can always normalize it later on to make it a unit vector, which too. And we'll use the vector negative h prime of r1. And you can see that this vector is clearly at right angles to the first vector because if you take the dot product of two things, you get minus h prime of r plus h prime of r, which is zero. So they're at right angles. And because the uh, second component is one, its y component is 1, so it's pointing upwards. So negative h prime of r of 1 is normal or perpendicular to h at the point r and is pointing upward. So the gives, gives, this gives us a normal vector in R2 to H before it's been rotated. But now the idea is, now use symmetry, rotational symmetry, and the fact that H of R theta is a surface of revolution to find a formula for the vectors normal to h of r theta. So I'm not going to write out a formula for this, but I am going to just say we're just thinking of taking this surface, this uh, h of r, if we rotate it around and make a surface of re re revolution, the normal vectors are like these blue negative h prime of r1 vectors, and they rotate around with the surface. So you can just, with sines and cosines, you can rotate those things around appropriately and find the normal vectors. So this is the easiest way to conceptualize how to do this, uh, easiest way to maybe um, compute it in your C++ program but it's maybe the hardest to write out an exact formula for directly. And rather than do that here, I'm going to go to methods two and three, which give us alternate ways to get the same formula in a little more methodical fashion. For the second method, we'll work with cross products of partial derivatives of a vector valued function. So for our vector valued function, we'll do something similar to a previous video. We'll define p of xz to be the vector x h of xz z. So for any scalar values x and z, p of xz is a point in 3 space, in xyz space, and the height is h of xz, that's the y value, and it's above the points xz and the xz plane. So in fact, this does define the surface of, the, of, of revolution. So this defines or traces out the surface of revolution. Uh, as x and z vary. So for the normal vector, what we'll do is we'll form the cross product of p with respect to z and p with respect to x. So we picked this particular order, the partial with respect to z across the partial with respect to x, because we want the normal vector to be pointing upwards. So from our top view, we have x vector to the right, z vector downward, and the y vector pointing out towards the viewer. And a partial with respect to z is going to be 
generally in a downward direction, of course, sloping up or down with the surface. Partial with respect to x is going to be generally in an x in the rightward direction. When we take their cross product, it'll be pointing, the result will be pointing generally outward, and thus this will give upward normals. So, what is the partial with respect to z? Well, partial with respect to x with respect to z is zero, so that's zero. Partial h with respect to z and one, cross product. And what's the partial with respect to x? Well, it's one, partial of h with respect to x and zero. When we take the cross product, it's easy to see that what we're getting is negative partial h partial x. That's because we're taking this partial h partial x times this one negated, and the other terms turn out to be zero. And then here is a one, because we've got a one times a one, and the other terms turn out to be zero. And partial negative partial h partial z. And this will be an upward pointing normal from the surface. This is of course using h in the form of a function of x and z. And how do we find partial of h with respect to x? Well, we can use the chain rule to say that's the same as the partial of h with respect to r times the partial of r with respect to x plus the partial of h with respect to theta times the partial of theta with respect to x. Well, this is equal to just the partial of h with respect to r times the partial of r with respect to x. Just because the partial of h with respect to theta is zero by virtue of the fact of h being a surface of revolution. So how do we find this? Well, we want a partial of h with respect to r. You can just compute from the formula earlier uh, for h. Partial of r with respect to x. Here we use the fact that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus z squared. So in particular, let's use the fact that r squared equals x squared plus z squared. And if you use implicit differentiation, we have that 2r partial r partial x equals 2x partial x partial x plus 2z partial z partial x, which is just 2x times 1, because partial x partial x is 1, and partial z partial x is 0. So that tells us here that partial r partial x equals x over r. And that gives us a formula for partial x, partial r, partial x. Similarly, partial r, partial z equals z over r. Putting all this together will give us a formula for a vector here perpendicular to the surface defined by h. So method number three is the gradient method, which is applied to 
an implicitly defined surface or a so-called level set. Here we have a function, I'll call it capital H, of x, y, and z, and the surface is supposed to be the set of points x, y, z where h equals zero. So this equals zero defines a surface. And we wanted to define the surface of revolution. So for this, we'll set h of x, y, z equal to y minus little h of x, z. And the idea being that h is zero exactly when y equals h of x, z. And so thus this does correctly define the surface of revolution. And I picked the sign here. I could have also used h of x, z minus y, but I picked the sign so that the at the end, the normals will be pointing upward. So the gradient of h is the triple partial capital H partial x, partial capital H partial y, partial capital H partial z, and if non-zero and well-defined, it will be perpendicular to the surface. Well, let's work out this gradient. The gradient of h is, so we take the partial of this expression with respect to x, that's minus partial h partial x, comma, the partial with respect to y is 1, and now the partial with respect to z is minus partial h partial z. And of course this is exactly the same formula that we got on the previous method, and so the same computations work to give us what the formula is for partial h with respect to x and partial h with respect to z. And also notice this is upward pointing, we have a 1 there, so the y component's always 1, so it is an upward normal. Of course, it may not be exactly perpendicular upward, but it's mostly upward, uh, so that's good. Also, notice that this formula is extremely similar to the formula of method 1, so it's very similar. To the method one result, method one. In fact, in some sense, it is the method one formula. So I'll finish up these presentations by mentioning a little bit about how draw elements works with this. So in particular, when we have a surface of rotation, surface of revolution, we can render it as radial triangle strips. So what I mean by a radial triangle strip is the following. Again, we're back to the top view. So the y-axis is pointing towards you, x-axis pointing some way, y-axis pointing some way, and a radial strip of the surface of rotation from the top will look something like this. Here's the center. So here's x equals 0, z equals 0, or here in the center. And we break this up into triangles like this. And we give, for the triangle strip, we can start at some center point, which I'll call v0. We then do v1, v2. By the right-hand rule, we're looking from the top. We then do v3 v4, v5, v6, and etc. going all the way out. So here there's, in this case, there's m levels. I've drawn it with m equals 3 because there's 1, 2, 3 levels going out. Finish drawing the triangle there. And um, you'll notice that there's 
2 times m plus 1 many vertices on this particular radial strip. The next radial strip would be up here. And it shares some vertices with the previous radial, radial strip. The next radial strip over would be here. And it again shares some verti vertices with the previous radial strip. And in this way, you don't have to re-give all these common vertices over and over again. They can share them. By using draw elements, you load the vertices into the VBO just once, and then let the elements pick out the correct vertices for each strip. So this is with the draw elements method. GL draw elements rendering method. It allows reusing vertices from strip to strip, from one triangle strip to the next. The only vertex to be careful about here is the central vertex, because these vertices have normals. Right? So if we pick a change the normal, we've essentially changed the to a different vertex. Now for the sign the function h that we're working with, h starts off, this is this uh, 1 plus 0 0.5, 0 0.8 x squared times sine x over x. This has slope 0 at the origin, so it's flat. You can you can verify this by, by L'Hopital's rule from calculus. It's the r-axis and y-axis. Now another possibility is that there might have been a cusp there. So for instance, we could have had a function like this. And then here, slope is non-zero at the origin. When you rotate this around, you get a point sticking up, a cusp. And then each radial strip should have a separate normal for the central V0 vertex. So you'd have to re replace the V0 vertex with a different one when you go to the next strip. On the other hand, if it's level, like in our example, we can reuse the same vertex V0 over and over again for each radial triangle strip. And that's the end of this presentation. Thank you for watching.